Welcome back, Knights. I'm Adam and Team, and today we're playing some more Reckoning at Gun Manor, the West of Loathing DLC. And today, we're back to hunt some more ghosts. We got to get rid of these things. I got 10 left, I think. So, if we can take care of half of them today, we should only have one more episode, and we should be able to finish the DLC, and we can go on to a new game. So, that'll be exciting. Right now, we're in Mr... Uh, Mr. Gunn's room. He has a big room, so we got to explore. I think there's a couple ghosts in this area. But I'm not sure how many. Okay, let's go into this room. This is the bowling alley. This bowling stuff is extremely broken. It's not something flying around, even a little bit. Let's fix it. Why does she go first? I want to go first. Okay. Um... All enemies for 7 damage. Or we do this. Why does that one do better than the other one? Like, why does... Her... All enemy attack do better than her single enemy attack? You would think that if it was concentrated on one... It would do more. If I press reset now... Oh, this is just an infinite fight. Okay, yeah, we're done. Wow, you hope you never meet a live dog this big. Yeah, if dogs are that big, they probably try to take over the world. It's sickening. Killing a helpless sofa and stuffing its carcass as a grizzly trophy. Just despicable. On the moose, one of the moose's eye is loose. Well, we could give this to, um... The bed and breakfast, or the boo and breakfast lady. This is just the head of a teddy bear. They don't even remove the tag. So many polyesters die just to decorate rooms like this. Turn off the fancy lamp. Knife marks. Oh. This ghost is dressed up as a traditional safari hunter with his helmet and big white mustache and those weird khaki trousers that make it look like your butt has wings. And she's inspecting Mr. Gunn's co trophy collection, but doesn't seem particularly impressed. Hi, I'm Bert Holiday. Hmm. Oh, charmed, I'm sure. Lord Euston Camdenton at your service. What's happened to you, if you don't mind my asking? Not at all, not at all. So it isn't a very exciting story. A what? I was hunting lions on the plain of Sparangetti, and one of the blighters got the better of me. Wow, you were eaten by a lion? That sounds pretty exciting to me. Yeah, well, not eaten as such. Sneaky bugger crept into camp and pushed a stack of ammunition crates over on me. Oh. Maybe I can help you? Hmm, help me do what? Well, help you with whatever is keeping you as a ghost. Though, now that I say it, I guess there isn't much I can do to help you get revenge on that lion. Oh, no, no. It isn't revenge that keeps me here. Good for that lion, I say. Turn about is fair play and all that, eh, what? Though, I do wish he'd done it in a manner that made for a better story. So, why are you a ghost, then? It's because of my one true regret. I never faced the most dangerous game. I'm definitely not going to help you hunt people. What? No, no, no. The most dangerous board game. Nobody's ever willing to play against me. A bally shame, eh? What? What's the game? He leads over to a small table on which is laid out a board of alternating red and black squares with little wooden discs painted red and black as well. Checkers? The checkers jump and scatter as the ghost stabs two large hunting knives in the center of the board. Knife checkers. Um, what are the rules? Do you know how to play checkers? Yes. Do you know how to stab someone in the hand with a knife? Yes. So I need to know, really. All right, I'll play. Oh, oh gosh. Okay, you wank one of the knives out of the board, and Lord Euston instructs you to hold it left-handed. The rules are you may only attack your opponent's hand, and only when they are over the board. Displaced checkers are played from where they land, but attacking the board directly is a foul, which awards the opponent a stab for each turn. It appears to be primarily a game of concentration, quick movements, and fainting. Play carefully. Lord Easton takes advantage of your hesitation and knifes you into this mission while marching his piece across the board. Ha! Nice try, lad, but you'll have to put up a better fight than that to satisfy me. Come back when those wounds have scabbed over, eh? What? Dang. Okay, so I need to get a lot of muscle. So if I put on my muscly items, like my, um, what's it called? Kurt's Fit Headband? No. Oh, the Strange Head Sack. And the Kurt's Fit Pants. There, that I should have enough muscle. Let's try again. I'm gonna play aggressively. 
You start the game by attacking quickly and fiercely to establish dominance and keep your opponent from developing his pieces. The strategy is somewhat effective, but Lord Euston doesn't scare easily and he manages to feint a few pieces past your guard. You enter the mid game more or less evenly matched. Play intelligently. In the mid game, you focus more on the checkers and on your knife work, maneuvering into positions for some big gains in the long term. You suffer a few minor nicks and cuts, but are well positioned for the end game. Play craftily. Lord Easton spots a hole in your defense, he feints left, then quickly slides one of his pieces into the gap and into your trap. This moves his hand into just the position you need to attack it with a hard downward stab. He easily yanks his hand out of the way and your knife hits one of your pieces on its edge, flipping it across the board and landing neatly in its back rank. King me. I say, it's a foul to attack the board. Sure, but I wasn't, was I? I attacked your hand and you dodged, that's all. You sneaky blighter. Play continues, but with the king behind Lord Euston's lines, you clean up fairly quickly. Alright, lad, I concede. Marvelous play, eh, what? Well done. He gives you a smart salute and fades away into nothingness. Whew. There we go. Took care of that one. There's a goblin head mounted like a trophy on the wall. This would be positively barbaric, if not for the fact that the goblin seems pretty okay with it. Boo! Ha ha ha. Pretty good I am to getting you, huh, human? Oh, wow, yes. Very much to getting me. Nice. What is happening? What is did happening to you? Did Mr. Gun hunting you and to cutting head off? No, no. Mr. Gun, a good human man, is being very friends. Inside one of his bowling ball bags, my spores to growing. Only headroom. Mr. Gun to finding me and hanging me up here for to chatting with. Great guy. Wow, weird. So he's only a head and now he just lives here? Huh. Well, that seems pretty boring. I'd be so bored. How often does Mr. Gun go in that room? It's a rack of billiards keys. Grab one. You got wobbly billiards key. Think about people who buy billiards tables that they're almost never the kind of people who will probably maintain their cues. The cue doesn't provide evidence of the contrary. There's a spittoon here. A bright, shiny, beautiful spittoon. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Oh boy. Oh yeah. Come to Papa. What are you doing? Huh? Uh, nothing. What are you doing? Looking at someone who's kneeling next to a spittoon with the apparent intention of sticking his whole entire face inside it? Dive in. You jam your hand into the spittoon up to your shoulder and find nothing. The brass bucket is shiny and clean outside and in, clean as the day it was born. The museum staff must have washed it. It looks brand new. Are you crying? No. I'm fine. You're crying. Okay, well, I'll just be over here whenever you're done lying on the ground in a fetal position and hugging a spittoon. Fine. Come on. They're supposed to have stuff in it. Hmm, there's a trap door in the ceiling over here. Too bad you aren't like 11 feet tall. Okay. Hey there, how's it going? I ain't interested in chit chat, fella. Just billiard. Step up or shut up. Challenge him to a game. You pull out your key and the ghost nods and racks the balls. He utterly trounces you. You just can't seem to make the balls go where you intended. That was sad as showing as I've ever seen. Let me see that cue. Yeah, that's your problem. This thing's about as straight as a baker's handshake. What? You're gonna need to lathe this back to true if you want a chance against me. Lathe? Hmm? How do I take care of it? I'm gonna make this silent real quick. Okay, how many ghosts are still here? Nine. In the guest rooms, there is the lady without the eyeball. Yes, kind of. How kind, thank you very much. She takes the glass eye from you and puts it in, whereupon it falls through her and onto the floor. She touches it, she picks it back up. Oh dear, it's a little too physical. Yeah, I wasn't certain this would work. Don't worry, this is easily fixed. Do you have a hammer I can borrow? A hammer? Uh, yes. That'll do nicely, thank you. She takes a hammer, places the glass eye on her desk, and smashes it with a precise crack. Ah, perfect. She gives you back the hammer and plucks the ghost of the glass eye from the shattered fragments. After blowing the dust off of it, she ducks it into her socket. That fits much better. Does it work? Hmm. Well, now that you mention it, no, I can't actually see with it. It is the ghost of a glass eye, after all. Oh dear, this won't do at all. What a shame. You know, I don't really understand why your eye is still missing. What do you mean? Well, I always assumed when someone loses an arm or something, it just sticks around as an arm ghost. That's what people say they can feel it itching sometimes, because you still got an arm there, but it's a ghost. It's even called phantom limb syndrome. So logically, if the rest of you becomes a ghost after that, it would hook right back up. But then, where did my eye go? Maybe it got pushed back inside your head? Go think about it for a second, then shake your head. No, that seems... Wait. What? I do think I felt something just then. She shakes her head again. My goodness gracious. Keep going. It's like one of those puzzles where you try to get the marble in the hole. 
She bends her head forward and continues shaking. You can almost hear a faint rattling sound and then a plop. She straightens back up, blinking with two eyes. You did it! Well, I'll be. Thank you so much, dear. I never would have thought of that. No problem. Have a nice time in heaven or wherever. The ghost gives you a friendly wave and fades out of sight. Well, that's that then. I found a way to make guns quiet. Hey, I... Shh. How many times do I have to tell you? Sorry, but I know how to make guns quiet. Oh, really? Can you show me? You nod. You quickly and quietly leave the library, gather materials for a cylinder, and head to the lab to craft it. You got a cylinder. You then return to the library and present it to the librarian. I invented this thing that makes guns really quiet. Oh, how marvelous. Finally, I can rest in peace knowing that libraries will now be safe from the noise of gunfire. It's only in an atmosphere of quiet that true joy there lives. Bertrand Russell. And with that, she dissipates into nothingness. He isn't, he isn't famous yet. Well, whatever. Okay, so I need to find dueling banjos. You have two books you can put back. You find the shelf where dueling banjos belong. I put it back. The previous shelf is entitled Dual Law. It seems to be about legal issues surrounding dueling. You never know what minutes come in handy. Duly noted. Okay, so I'm guessing I have to put back... Oh! Find the shelf where Fun Law belongs and put it back. The next shelf... Next book on the shelf is entitled Gun Law. It's trying to be even more entertaining. Okay, well... I'm gonna read Basics of Gun Law. You learn basically everything there is to know about gun law. Now you can be their prosecuting attorney and defense counsel in addition to judge, jury, and executioner. Put the book back on the shelf. Now... What about dual law? Okay. So I read this then. You learn about tending to dueling. It turns out when two guys want to murder each other in a fair and reasonable manner, things get legally tricky. Okay. Objection. Huh? What are you objecting to? Your face! Overruled. What's your problem anyway? Bah, it's legal stuff. You'll never understand. In fact, I think you'll find... I'm quite conversant in the finer points of our justice system, particularly as it pertains to guns and gun-related activity. Horse reddish, you're all trousers and no briefs. Oh yeah? Well, just try me, smart lady. <sighs> Fine. Obviously, you aren't going to leave me alone, so just ask your questions. Ahem. I'm Bird Holiday, speaking for the record, state your name, occupation, and cause of death. Felicity Wainwright, defense attorney, lost a court approved to trial by combat. What? Trial by combat has been outlawed for like 15 years. You do understand that ghosts don't visually age as time passes, right? Oh, right. So, your client called for trial by combat, which meant you and the prosecutor had to face off in a duel. That's correct. And you lost? She squints at you. Are you acting dumb or trying to throw me off guard? I would draw the question. Why are you stuck as a ghost? Because although trial by combat was already well out of fashion at that time, it was still a valid legal resource. I should have been prepared for the possibility, but I wasn't. My lack of training resulted in an innocent man being executed for murder. Oof, how was he executed? Hanging, I assume. Obviously, I wasn't around to see it. So, to release you, I need to prove that the loss wasn't your fault. The trial duel was completely fair and above board. There is no chance of there having been foul play on the prosecutor's part. My loss was my own. Then, I'd have to prove your client was actually guilty, and therefore your feelings of responsibility are misplaced. The look she gives you is hard and cold. Look, you think you know a thing or two about the law. How about you tell me the first rule being an offense attorney? Don't refer to the gal as a weird little hammer. You have to trust and believe in your client. If you don't believe your client is innocent, you'll never convince anyone else he is either. So if I want to convince you he was guilty, you'll have an uphill fight, fellow. You're essentially playing prosecutor here. All right, tell me about the case. My defendant was Matthew Guilty McCready, accused of the murder of Victor Vic Timsbury at noon on June 18th, 1878 in Reno. I have some questions. Go ahead. Your client was actually named Guilty? Come on. Names don't mean anything. I once had a client named Ike Ildegai, and he was totally innocent. For someone's actual legal name, sure, but nicknames are usually given with some sort of basis. You never met a really tall guy called Tiny or a fat guy called Slim? Arguably, the name Guilty would reinforce my client's innocence. That's totally absurd, but I'll let it rest for now. What was the cause of death? Timsbury was shot through the heart with a 45 caliber revolver. And didn't Creedy own such a gun? Yes, he was holding it at the time, and subsequent examination showed that it had been recently fired. Are you messing with me? Any further questions? Yes, you do have some more questions, yeah. 
This was at noon precisely? Yes, that was confirmed by a witness. Also, McCready owned a fancy pocket watch that chimed on the hour. There were witnesses, about half a dozen of them. I'm pretty sure there's something you aren't telling me. I'm not obligated to play with my hands face up, Mr. Prosecutor. Okay, then. Go ahead. Hang on a second. Shot with a pistol in front of witnesses at exactly noon. Was this a duel? So you can add 2 plus 2 after all. Well done. Well, as luck would have it, I just recently read a whole book about duel law. What? Why? No reason. I just happened to cross it in the library and thought it might be interesting. You read an entire code of law. You found it random just for the heck of it? Yep. Let me just do a quick review. A duel is legal provided it's between exactly two people at a specific prearranged time and place using the same or at least essentially similar weapons and they have to either face each other down and quick draw at the appointed moment or do the 10 paces turn and fire routine. Is that right? That's the gist of it, yes. So I guess let's start with you telling me the facts of the case and I'll interrupt you rudely if I have any questions. Alright, but if you push me on trivial nonsense, I'll get mad and you'll have to start over. That seems fair. Go ahead. McCready and Timsbury got into an argument on the evening of June 17th. Apparently, Timsbury accused McCready of cheating at poker. Go on. The bartender yelled at them to take it outside, but since it was dark out, they agreed to meet for a duel the next day. And that would be the 18th, you said. Yes, June 18th, 1878. Did they set a specific time for the duel? Yes, high noon. Figures, why is it always high noon? Tradition, I suppose, and it, since the sun is at the highest in the sky, everything's brightly lit and there aren't many shadows, so that's good for gunfighting. Makes sense. Let's see, you can go have your duel on your lunch break. What happened next? Well, the next day, they both showed up shortly before noon and squared off about 30 feet from each other. When noon struck, McCready fired fast enough that didn't get his shot off on account of having his head shot off. That's pretty much the long and short of it. What weapons were they using? McCready had a 45 caliber single action army revolver. Tim Terry had an old model 36 caliber Captain Ball Navy revolver, which he loaded with proper cartridges instead of packing the gunpowder by hand. Objection. Those are significantly different weapons. Are you kidding me? They're both pistols. A modern cartridge revolver versus an antique cap and ball loader? Ridiculous. That antique was in production until 1873 and was considered one of the most reliable and popular six shooters in the territories. Furthermore, the restrictions against differing weapons in a duel is about pistols versus rifles, or the proverbial knife in a gunfight, or, as the most recent example, a nitwit arguing the law against a professional attorney. Jeez, that's a bit harsh. We're done here. Get out. She doesn't have to get on the side of the door. Rats. <sighs> that's gonna be a long one. Time to do it all over again. Tell me more about the argument. There is so much to tell the other players in the game who had already folded their hands in that round, so they weren't paying very close attention. All we know is that Tim Berry suddenly accused McCready of being a dirty cheat environment, and McCready said Tim Berry was just sore because he had been losing all night. Did McCready have a history of cheating? He was accused of it once or twice before, but Reno's a gambling town, and he hung out in the rough part of it, getting accused for cheating by a sore loser when you're on lucky streak is part of the course. But if McCready had a history of cheating, it would be relevant because the reason for the duel is immaterial to the legality of the duel itself. Motive isn't an issue here, but remember how I warned you about taking me off with stupid digressions? This is an excellent example. Fine, fine. What happened next? The bartender yelled at them to take it outside. Since it was dark, they agreed to meet for a duel the next day. Okay, I have a question. Why didn't they just fight right then? Because it was dark. You can't have a gunfight in the dark. No, I get that. But they could have just had a regular old fist fight. They were mad enough to shoot each other to death, but not to punch each other. Well, without getting too psychoanalytical, these guys were gunfighters. I mean, they counted that as a significant part of their identity. Fighting without guns was just not just outside their wheelhouse. They considered it a waste of their time and talents. Like asking a fancy French chef to make you a grilled cheese sandwich. He fired exactly at noon. Yes, as soon as the church bell started ringing. So McCready fired as soon as the church bell struck noon. Yes, that's what I just said. Have you got a point to make or are you just stalling for time to think? Injection. God, what the heck? McCready fired at the wrong time. What are you talking about? He fired at exactly noon with the church bell. There are witnesses. That's right. He fired at clock noon, but the duel was set for high noon. They aren't the same thing. High noon is just when the sun is at its highest point in the sky, depending on geography and the time of the year. It, it can be hours in from clock noon. McCready fired early, and that makes a duel illegal. So what do you say to that, counselor? Felicity gives you a low smile. Got to hand it to you, Prosecutor Holiday. You're a lot better at this than I was giving you credit for. It's a good thought you had there. There's just one problem with it. Oh, what's that? I already thought it. Take that. 
She holds a small book at you with it just barely managed to catch. Got 1878 Nautical Almanac. Gah, what the heck is this? Did my homework when I was preparing for my trial, my legal homework. Since at that time I expected there to be an actual trial, not a gunfight. What you're holding there is a Nautical Almanac for the year 1878. There are bookmarks if you'd like to do the math yourself. But if you look up solar noon, aka high noon, for June the 18th and make the adjustment for Reno's longitude, what do you think you get? You've got to be kidding me. That's right, Mr. Prosecutor. 12 o'clock p.m. precisely. No! Well, darn. Nice try, though. I mean, that sincerely. That's all my ammo. I can't think of any other way to disprove McCready's innocence. As far as I can see, it was a fair duel. Yes, and that's me with the guilt of an innocent man's death on my hand. An innocent man's death? You sure are good at repeating things people say. What if he didn't die? Say what now? But if you didn't actually see the execution, right? Yeah, well, I was indisposed. You might say being dead and all. So you don't actually know whether or not it happened. Oh, come on. Look, I appreciate the effort, but you're barking at the moon. It was a trial right after the duel, the 19th. Ha, no, I don't know what Reno is like now, but I didn't have a private courthouse then, and you can't try a murder charge in the sheriff's front parlor. McCready sat in jail for a couple weeks and then transported him to Frisco. What with one thing and another, the trial didn't start until July 25th. Gee, so much for the right to speedy trial. The wheels grind slow. When was the execution? Well, we held the trial by combat on the 26th, and that was on Fridays. They don't execute prisoners on the weekends, so presumably it would have been following Monday, the 29th. In the morning? While we're setting up the gallows and letting a crowd gather, they usually happen in the afternoon, around 3 typically. McCready was a gunfighter through and through, and by that I mean he is an adrenaline addict and dueling was his needle of choice. Hell, if you told me he had evidence that he cheated at poker with the specific intent of baiting people into challenging him to duels, I wouldn't be at least a bit surprised. He was a sly one. Person's off on sides. I make him sound like a real devil. That's not fair. He was smart and charming. Could have been a good man if he'd chosen an entirely different life for himself. Hmm, well, I recall he had a real good head for numbers. He told me that he never got a date in every man he ever killed. He remembered to pour a beer on their grave on their birthday. Well, that's nice. Mm-hmm. A nicer birthday present would have been not having killed them in the first place, of course. Yep. Why did he invoke trial by combat? Assuming he was innocent, why would McCready invoke trial by combat? His case was pretty straightforward. A duel only worsened his odds. It was mighty surprised, let me tell you. The only thing I can figure is it was his damn fool sense of gunfighter's pride or something like that. It was the only form of justice he was willing to submit himself to. Hmm. Oh my, this is going to take forever to get this lady to... Um... Okay, uh, we'll come back. That's uh, that's gonna be a hard one to figure out. Ooh. There's the photo of the guy. So you have returned. Have you recovered the photograph I require? I found an old photo that actually looked like you here. Ah, marvelous. What a resemblance. Yeah, it's pretty decent pic. Good thing light travels faster than bullets. Now my image will not be lost to the ravages of time. Mercy BQ, my friend. He hangs a photo in the window that sways into nothingness. I'll keep the same. Okay, transcribe the music. We got a spooky lullaby sheet. So can I now conduct this for the guy that has the song in his head? Play the lullaby. Why am I looking backwards and playing? That's kind of creepy. Makes it all the more creepy. He disappeared. We did it. Soothing. Okay, that's another ghost gone. Five ghosts left. Okay. Um, next, 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 next. How do we fix our pool cue? Okay. You lay the rinse and repeat until the queue is fixed. So now we got a balanced billiard queue, so we can go back to the guy in the billiard room and we can take care of that ghost as well. Perfect. Challenge him to a game. You pull out your queue and ghost nods, racks the balls. If he sees to crush you, something feels wrong, like your queue is connecting with the ball, probably. Ghost shakes his head at you. Totally new to this, ain't you? You gotta chalk your queue. Chalker, can I borrow yours? Mine's ghost chalk, wouldn't work. Dang it. 
Where can I get chalk from? Wait a second. Why don't you just stock this into one of those cigars you found? There we go. So now I have the exploding cigar. Did you figure out how to make a good exploding cigar? One that doesn't turn fun into a funeral. Oh, I can't even make basic wordplay funny. Well, I thought it was kind of clever. But. I think it's what you're looking for. That's an exploding cigar. Yep, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, but not this time. What'd you use for explosives? I found a really small firecracker just big enough to blow up the cigar without also blowing up someone's face. Also, without the, you know, violent lead projectile. You're a genius. Please let me see it in action so I can finally rest. Light it up. Oh. Whoa. We did it! Okay. So that's that. Okay, we have four ghosts left, but I think I'm going to leave that for the next episode of Reckoning of Gun Manor, which will be the final episode on this DLC. This wasn't a very long DLC, but I really hope you guys did enjoy, and if you did, please share with your friends. It would be greatly appreciated, and always remember to wear adamantium armor.